So what is MTSSP? MTSSP is an acronym. It stands for a multi-tiered system of support for behavioral health and wellness. It is both a system and a process. When done well, MTSSB empowers a completely community-based response to the specific needs of that community's students and uh, adults. It explores all of the risk and protective factors at the community level, um, and it helps to develop an action plan for how best to respond to them. MTSSB is not a curriculum. It is not a service. It is not a therapy. It's a process and a system that can be installed at a community level based on the community uh, needs, risks, and protective factors. Because of that, because it's a community-based model, it looks different in every community that does it. Each community is, is different in terms of their needs. The protective factors that exist in one community may not exist in another. So the outcomes and the work that is done within the system and the process looks different from community to community. MTSSB is based on a public health approach. As we go through the process and we um, are starting to do our community-based planning, we think about what we can do to ad address wellness for all. What can we do to address <coughs> wellness for those with slightly um, elevated level of need? And then, what do we do for those at the top with the, mo with the need for a mo more intensive approach? This public health thinking applies to many aspects of student wellness, um, whether it be services and supports for students, strategies for partnering with families, or um, addressing the learning needs of our educators and the adults that work within the system. Here in New Hampshire, student wellness efforts are strongly <coughs> based in whole or in part on what's known as the Safe Schools Healthy Students Framework. It was developed by SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration at the federal level, after the Columbine shooting in 1999. They essentially did a whole bunch of research and they said, how can we work to ensure that something like this doesn't happen again? And they sort of boiled it down to a specific set of strategic approaches. That would be your white circles up at the top. Some areas of potential focus, which are those purple boxes there in the middle. But I wanted draw your attention to the roots of our tree here, which are the guiding principles that are the basis for any good, strong student wellness initiative. First and foremost, everything must be family and youth driven. Secondly, it has to be community based. I think there is probably no place where that is more true than here in New Hampshire. They're culturally and linguistically competent, um, and they respond to the, the specific culture of the community that they are going to support and address. And culture takes a lot of different manifestations in different parts of, this, uh, of the city. It may be something that we're considering in terms of language access, if you're in one of the school districts that speaks up to 48 different languages. It may be something pertaining to, um, to religion, in terms of whether or not you're, you're doing different celebrations or you're celebrating at all. It may uh, be a consideration about what sort of um, extracurricular activities you can provide your community because families may not be in a place to engage in, in that um, in, in those services and supports. So it's really understanding the culture of your specific community um, and responding appropriately. It's very important that when you engage start to engage in student wellness work you think about sustainability. So we're not looking to set up a program or identify a service or start down the path of developing this system without a plan for what it's going to look like down the road. We also want to make sure that everything that we do is evidence-based. We want to make sure that we know it works. The two things that I consistently hear on a daily basis we are lacking are time and money. We can't spend time or money on things that we know we don't know are going to work. So we need to find things that work. So that sort of outlines the system of MTSSB. Let's talk a little bit about the process and how we get there. The Bureau of Student Wellness encourages and supports local districts to convene what are called community management teams. On the side, there is a handout that looks like this, and at the top it says, Community Management Team Pre-Development Planning Tool. This outlines <coughs> what a community management team is, why it's important to have one, 
ability to blend and raise funding, opportunities to learn about and leverage existing services, exposure to multiple perspectives on the experience of children and youth, increased opportunity for sustainability and activities of activities and programming, and a more supportive and positive environment for the community's children, youth, and families overall. That's why we want to convene this team. Who should sit on it? That list down there at the bottom sort of breaks down some ideas of who should be on the team, but again, this is a fully locally driven process. So it may look different community to community. I would say that the sort of pillars and, and the sort of consistent um, representatives that we encourage to sit on every community, community management team include families, students or youth, because again, everything that we do is family driven and youth guided, members of the um, school system, and members of the community mental health system. So those are sort of the four uh, pillars and then everything else, um, and because every community has that. Um, and then, you know, it sort of varies from there. So that team comes together, that multi-dimensional stakeholder team, to engage in this process. They work together to look at the needs <coughs> of their community. What are all of those risk factors that exist? What are, what are families telling us? What are our students telling us? What are members of the community observing? What does the police chief have to say about, you know, sort of how the youth are, are um, participating in the community at large? So sort of collate all of that. Then move into the environmental scan. Let's look for those protective factors. What is it in our community that is positive and that exists for our youth to help them be well, completely engaged, and participating actively in a positive way in their life? Then we compare the two, and we identify where there are gaps. From there, we know where to start. If we did not go through this intentional process, it would be like throwing spaghetti at the wall. Because time and resources are so limited, we want to be sure that we are going where we can make the biggest difference and where there is needed um, attention. Our team does sometimes go and help facilitate these meetings and facilitate these conversations, but it looks different in every community. The needs assessment looks different in every community. The environmental scan looks completely different in every community. And how they choose to address it, that work plan, that looks totally different in every community. Because we've been doing this now for a few years, we've started collating what we've learned. That's where things like this community management <laughs> development tool come from, our online toolkit. So all of our learning is being put together in these hopefully easy to use sheets that can be accessed by any and all districts and communities that are interested. I'll tell you that um, there are a lot of people using this that, that we didn't know of at the outset. They reveal themselves to us, um, you know, what feels like increasingly weak now. So let's circle back to um, the system and talk a little bit about what some of the, um, some of the, uh, some communities are doing at each of these tiers. Again, because this is a fully community driven process, no com two communities look the same. Um, so the examples that I'm going to give you are happening in at least one community, but I, I don't have a way of knowing how pervasive. The one thing that we do see as fairly consistent universal approach is professional development. Again, remember when we started this presentation and I talked to you about protective factors, I told you that the number one protective factor is a good, strong, stable relationship with at least one adult. A good way to get there is to train the adults to be prepared to fill that role. Another universal strategy that can be used is social emotional learning. Um, as the commissioner mentioned, it's a process through which children and adults um, acquire and effectively apply knowledge, attitudes, and skills. What you see here is a graphic representation of um, the work of an organization called CASEL. CASEL has been doing 
research on SEL um, for quite some time, and it's essentially broken down into uh, five um, components with commonly accepted that. So self-management, ability to successfully regulate one's emotions, thoughts, and behaviors in different situations. So, you know, that might look like remaining calm. That might look like advocating for yourself. Um, you know, situational differences. How do you sort of process what you're going through and then respond accordingly? Self-awareness, the ability to accurately recognize one's own emotions and thoughts and how they influence your behavior. So that thought process that happens before you act. Social awareness, ability to take perspective of and empathize with others, including those with diverse cultures and backgrounds. One of our primary guiding principles was cultural linguistic competency, right? Understanding that our community is made up of diverse um, individuals. And so we want to be able to recognize that diversity and then be able to respond in kind. Relationship skills, establish and maintain healthy and rewarding relationships with those in our community. Responsible decision making. Make constructive choices about personal behavior and social interactions based on ethical standards, safety concerns, and social norms. All of that might sound familiar because it is, um, they represent in large part those 40 developmental assets that I talked about in terms of being protective factors. So these would be the protective factors. SEL is how you learn those skills to be able to, to put things into practice. They also are what we commonly hear from the business community as being the skills that are most needed in employees and generally are lacking. So it's something that we're hearing a lot about, that there's a need for um, <coughs> children and youth to develop these skills. Now remember, this is all part of MTSSB, which is a community-driven process. Any work that's done on SEL should be reflective of that process, the needs assessment, the environmental scan, and the gaps analysis and resulting work plan that's developed by our community management team with our diverse stakeholders. SEL, in general, is not a curriculum. But you can get a curriculum to support SEL. You could buy one. You could make up your own, which we don't encourage because we're looking for something that's data-driven. Or you could access a free curriculum, like the Cho Scarlett Lewis Choose Love curriculum that the governor has endorsed. Shannon, um, sorry to put you on the spot, Shannon <laughs> is in the, in the audience. She's an employee of the governor's office, um, and she's making that curriculum available for free to any New Hampshire districts that are interested. So SEL is also not a treatment or a therapy. That said, Sometimes, therapy and counseling, generally what happens in the community mental health system or with mental health providers, can address the skills that are developed through SEL. But SEL in and of itself is not a treatment or a therapy. It is also not a diagnosis or a disorder. It's a process through which people develop skills to address those five areas. 